Good afternoon. We're going to begin lesson 36, the 400 silent years between the Old and the New Testament. Uh, before we start, if you're on Facebook, please share. And if you're on YouTube, subscribe, like, and share. Thank you so much for helping with me with that. Let's pray. We're asking in your name, Jesus, for your presence here, for you to touch me, touch everyone listening. Help us, Lord, to come closer to you. Help us, Lord, to understand your word. Help us, Lord, to be able to get a hold of it to the point where we can be your witnesses in this world. That was your, your final commands while you were out yet on this earth. Go ye, go ye, go ye, go ye, go ye. Help us, Lord, to obey that in your name. Amen. <coughs> Lesson 36. And, of course, between the Testaments, Last week we talked about at the end of Malachi, they were in Persian rule. The Greeks moved in, Alexander the Great specifically, later at Antiochus Epiphanes, and of course he was a tyrant, and uh, he had uh, the statue of Jupiter, the image of Jupiter, and, and uh, he sacrificed pigs on the altar, the temple altar. So it was, they went down, but we had some Maccabees come on the scene. It was Matthias and his son. Uh, they, they came and they were able to run the Grecians off. I mean, uh, Maccabean means hammer and they dealt some hammer blows to the Grecians and the Jews were at peace for several years, but in 63 BC we find out that the Roman Empire uh, came in and has taken over and they are now in control now. And so it begins some more persecution uh, on the Jews. So uh, with that, let's take a look at uh, the Old Testament ca canon. This is where I left off last week. And we talked about the fact that uh, the canon is the actual list of Old Testament books. Remember, Bible means books. It, it, there are 66 books in the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. Uh, what we're looking at here, though, is that these 39 books, uh, they weren't just arbitrarily put in there. There's no error. There's no contradiction. There's perfect harmony, perfect unity in the Bible. And in the Old Testament, the scribes were meticulous at making sure every word was written down exactly the way that God wanted it written. In fact, when they were copying the scrolls, the law, uh, and all the other things that uh, were put into the Old Testament, the scribes would uh, take one letter and the person would tell the one writing, write that one down. He'd write it down, they would check it out, and then they go to the next letter and they keep going. And, and then uh, they had others coming in checking on it. And if there was an error, they ripped up the entire scroll and they had to begin all over again. So it was a, a tremendous way to ensure that the Old Testament came to us exactly as, as God wanted it to come. And uh, we see too that uh, canon, what does canon mean? It, it's, uh, it's a cane, that's an Old Testament word for cane. It was a measuring rod. Uh, they used a cane to measure everything. Well, the canon became the measuring rod for us to say, this is the correct Bible. This is the one that we should use. And it's, uh, the, it's the canon is what we are using today in the Bible, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The uh, uh, Apocrypha, this is a group of books that came along in this 400 years of silence when God wasn't talking to the people. And they've caused a lot of damage because uh, if you look at them, there's errors in them, there's contradictions, there's fiction, there's, there's uh, myth, mythology in it. And uh, uh, how do I say this? Uh, the general term is applied to the book and verses added to the Bible when it was first translated, basically because it held the history of the Jews during the 400 years of silence. So what I'm saying there is that the Apocrypha was in the King James Bible when it came out, but it specifically said this is not part of the Bible. Why was it put in there? Because there are some history books within the Apocrypha uh, that varies uh, with different churches, 12 to uh, 15 books, and uh, some of them, uh, 
of the churches have some uh, things added to the books that were already in the Old Testament. So uh, again, we're looking at the, the, the thing here that the Apocrypha uh, was not a part of the Bible, but many have put that Apocrypha into their uh, Bibles. The Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern, Eastern Orthodox, and the Oriental or Orthodox enclose various books of the Apocry Apocrypha in their specific canons. Uh, it is included in the Septuagint. Uh, it's a Greek version of the Bible. And the Vulgate, a Catholic version, but excluded from Jewish and Protestant canons of the Bible. And, and again, it was in the original King James, but they said, this is not part of the Bible. We're, we're putting these books in here because we want you to know about uh, Matthias, Ma the, the, uh, the Maccabees, because they were so influential in the history of, of the Jews. The Anglican Church emphatically maintains that the Apocrypha is part of the Bible and is to be read with respect by her members but cannot be used as doctrine. That's kind of a funny way of putting that, but that's the Anglican Church. On special holy days, sections of Tobit, Wisdom, and Sirach are read by the Episcopal Church in America. The Apocrypha applies to fictitious or legendary accounts. They are plausible enough to be commonly considered true. For example, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte's self-coronation rather than at the hands of uh, Pope Pius VII, and Parson Weems' account of George Washington and the cherry tree. They sound real, but they're not. The, the Apocrypha is made up of books that uh, are similar to this. Uh, the Catholic Bible today contains all the uh, 15 different books, and it has uh, some other passages put into some Old Testament books. Uh, these apocryphal books are called Deuterocanical. Deuterocanical. Uh, they're secondary canon. Uh, they, they're, they're books placed in the Catholic Bible, but they're not part of the original. These are something else that were put in. So right away they're saying there's something wrong with these books. Uh, but yet they, uh, they uh, won't admit that they are not part of the real Bible. Uh, they distinguish this difference by calling them deuterocanical. Uh, I'll have to say that again. Deuterocanical. I hope you can get that from what I'm just saying there. So, uh, again, this is the Old Testament and uh, this is how the canon was put together by the scribes being so influential. Now we look at new religious groups, scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees. They came into existence at this time. Let's take a look at the scribes. <coughs> Primary job, copy and preserve scriptures. Became teachers of the law and took great pride in their position. Interpreters of the law, added to the law, and developed the law. Pharisaic representatives, ultimate authorities on faith and practice. Okay, they were very helpful to the Pharisees. The priests, they were members of the tribe of Levi, but not all Levites were priests. Qualified descendants of Aaron were priests. Three, the high priests, Caiaphas and Annas, were political appointees. They weren't qualified to be priests. Four, only one high priest was to serve in the temple and lead the Israelites at a time. Luke 3, 2, and Acts 4, verse 6 uh, state that Annas and Caiaphas were both high priests. You can only have one high priest. But again, they were political appointees. They were not true priests, and so uh, they were in heirs in, a multi, uh, in many, many ways. Uh, Five, John the Baptist's father was the last true high priest listed in the Bible, which means John the Baptist was next in line to be the high priest. So uh, when he came out, repent, 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 the priests were interested in what he was doing because, uh, again, they knew there's going to be a voice out of the wilderness, but, uh, and they knew that he was supposed to be or had the legal rights to be in the true high priest. 
And of course, uh, the priests, uh, Sadducees were basically priests. Okay, let's take a good look at the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Pharisees were laymen, merchants, businessmen, patriotic, zealous, traditionalist hypocrites. <laughs> That's what Jesus called them. They hated Sadducees and Jesus. They believed in the resurrection, life after death, and immortality. They believed in angels, spirits, and demons. They adhered to the Old Testament legalism. God has a plan. They controlled the synagogues. Uh, doing good is the duty of man. Turn to formalism and ceremonialism. Uh, when you get away from God's spirit, when things uh, are just in writing and uh, you're not praying, you're not doing what you're supposed to be, it's easy to go and to just let's make it look like we're doing what we're supposed to and get very formal and ceremonies are big, big things. Uh, the good aspect of it, of the Pharisees, is our righteousness must, must exceed theirs. That's in Matthew 5.20, that uh, our, our righteousness, the things that we do right, has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. That's, that's strong. Okay, Sadducees, they were a priestly group of religious leaders, aristocratic, wealthy, hated by the masses, hated Pharisees and Jesus, too. Uh, did not believe in the resurrection, life after that. That's a big one. They believed in the resurrection. They did not believe in the resurrection. Uh, three, did not believe in the supernatural. Four, observed the Pentateuch only. The first five books of the, the Bible was called the Pentateuch. They observed that. The rest of the Old Testament, uh, no. Five, man plans has a free will. Six, maintain temple worship. Pharisees, synagogues, uh, priests, temple worship. Seven, very rigid in judging offenders of the law. Eight, happiness found in the present in modernism and liberalism. Who, uh, they were getting very liberal. They were getting very far from the written word. Uh, they, were, they were swaying very far from God. Uh, the key here is they were worldly. Uh, use the temple as a place of business. The Pharisees were hypocrites. The Sadducees were very worldly. Scribes, Pharisees made up the Sanhedrin and the priest Sadducees. Uh, what is the Sanhedrin? It's the highest Jewish council or court. It's a group of judges. They were made up of a council of 70 Jewish men. It was led by the high priest, the supreme court in legal and religious trials. Most Sadducean priests, but uh, mostly Sadducean priests, but some Pharisees. So again, uh, the Sadducees had a strong control over the Sanhedrin, which was a Jewish council or, or court. This is the one that tried Jesus when he was uh, uh, in his trials before his death on the cross. Okay, we're looking here now at Greek translation of scriptures. I stated how, uh, uh, let me think, uh, he was the Grecian leader, uh, Antiochus the Great. Okay, uh, he came in and he wanted everybody to accept the Grecian culture. And uh, so we have the Greek translation of scriptures starting back here. Of course, they were learning the, the, the uh, Grecian language. The New Testament hasn't, had not been written yet, but we already see what was taking place here, that the uh, uh, Greek, God was preparing them for the uh, New Testament, which would be basically written in Greek. There was a quest for knowledge, and I already stated how Alexandria, Egypt, uh, became a center for knowledge and philosophy and uh, sin, worldliness, uh, the mystery Babylon religion. Uh, it became a terrible place in God's eyes. Uh, every one of our versions of our that have come out today, they all come from Alexandria, Egypt. The King James Bible comes from Antioch, Syria. Universal Greek language. Uh, be, everybody's going to use this language. So they may have known Hebrew, but they had to learn Greek. 
there was religious dissatisfaction. Of course, the Greeks came down on the Jews and they were persecuting them. They were trying to destroy them. And then they, they got this well, about 170 years of, of peace. And then we see that uh, Roman came in and now they're under Roman control. So uh, persecution and dispersion, of course, when there's persecution, that always means that those people had to go somewhere else at that time. Then we have something very important here. We have the Roman roads were built. And of course, it paved the way for Christ and his gospel. Uh, when the Romans ro roads were made, the message of, of the gospel went out to all parts of the world. Dispensation, a period of time in which God works with man in a particular way. The first dispensation was um, no sin. Adam and Eve walked with God. They were made stewards of God's earth. There were sins of unbelief and disobedience, changes the plan of salvation to belief and obedience, and that ended the uh, incense, the uh, innocence, excuse me. Uh, it ended that dispensation. Uh, dispensation, a period of time in which God works with man in a particular way. This is how uh, it started, but this is going to change everything. We're going to start seeing that in the dispensation of conscience, blood sacrifices covered man's sins. Sin. Conscience guided man's moral acts. Uh, they had to, uh, they started at that time calling on the name of the Lord. Human government came in. It was authority to, God gave them authority to govern others. Capital punishment was instituted at that time. God told them if someone kills someone, you kill them. Uh, at Tower of Babel, uh, men and religious system was scattered all over the earth. Tower of Babel happened in this human government, and that was when Nimrod, a, a leader, gathered all the people together and was setting up his kingdom at Babel. And of course, God had to come down, and he changed their languages. They all spoke in, uh, they spoke in tongues at that time, and they ended up dispersing to all parts of the earth. And that's how our original language changed to so many different languages and, that we have today. And of course, uh, on the day of Pentecost, Jesus came down. He was setting up his kingdom. They spoke in tongues again, but this was from God, and they were receiving God's spirit. It was the evidence that they were receiving the Holy Ghost. Promise, it's an everlasting covenant began between God and Abraham. All who believed and obeyed the God's covenant terms were Abraham's heirs. The law. Uh, moral law. It was the Ten Commandments, the judicial and dietary law, and the ceremonial law, which was the tabernacle plan. The law exposed man's sinfulness, but the tabernacle showed them the way to escape hell. The grace dispensation, this 2,000 year period we're living in right now. Salvation came at his death, shedding of blood. New covenant laws are written in hearts. Those born again enter the kingdom of God. You've got to be, you cannot see, you cannot enter the kingdom of God until you're born of water and spirit. That's in John 3, 3, 3, 5. Kingdom age. Jesus returns and reigns on the earth. For 1,000 years, righteousness and peace prevail. Saint loose for a season. Uh, it ends at the white throne judgment. I'm going to take a quick look at these. Uh, dispensations, a period of time when God works with man in a particular way. Uh, dispensations end in judgment due to disobedience. Innocence uh, ended in the expulsion from the Garden of uh, Eden. Conscience ended in the flood. Human government, the dispersion that took place at the Tower of Babel. Promise, the Egyptian bondage. The law, Jesus took the judgments of all mankind on himself when he died on the cross. And that was the end of the law as they knew it. And he fulfilled the law at that time when we go into the New Testament, New Testament covenant, the new covenant, and we see the changes that he made. And then the grace it end, is going to end in the tribulation period, and the millennial is going to end in the white throne judgment. So for every dispensation, there was a judgment that ended it. Now, uh, 
I put this slide together because there was seven days in creation, and there's seven uh, dispensations, uh, periods of time. There's innocence, conscience, human government, uh, promise, and the law, law, grace, grace. Uh, 4,000 years here, 2,000, 1,000, it covers a period of 7,000 years. So uh, we also look at the fact that between the grace and the millennium is going to be a seven-year tribulation period. So we're looking at seven creative days, 7,000 years, seven dispensation, and, and then uh, seven years at tribulation period. The Old Testament is incomplete without the New Testament. The new is in the old contained. The old is in the new explained. The new is in the old concealed. The old is by the new revealed. The new is in the old enfolded. The old is in the new unfolded. A lot of people say we don't need the Old Testament. Yes, we do. It's, it, we've got to have it. There's an Old Testament's made up of four-fifths of the Bible. And if we do away with it, we only have one-fifth of the Bible left. Uh, we have to have. The Old Testament helps us to understand the New Testament. The value of the Old Testament. Jesus, the apostles, and early church all used the Old Testament since the New Testament had not been written. Uh, Jesus and the apostles, all they had was the Old Testament to witness to people. Jesus quoted extensively from the Jews' Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. When tempted by the devil, he quoted, It is written, the first temptation, Deuteronomy 6.16, the second temptation, and Deuteronomy 16.3, uh, three, the third temptation, endorsing the fact of their divine origin. Jesus quoted to say, how important is the Bible? How did he defeat the devil? It is written from Old Testament scriptures. In Luke 24, 27, when the two disciples were walking down the road of Emmaus, uh, and, and also with the disciples in the upper room, Jesus opened their understanding by going back to the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, which is the Old Testament, explaining to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And the Bible says it opened up their understanding. In Acts 6, the leaders of the church were having to leave the Word of, leave the word of God and serve tables of widows when they should have been studying so they could preach and teach. They found seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, to a point over the business of helping the widows. The word they were studying was the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament yet. The value of the Old Testament continued. 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17 says, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. Jesus, the apostles, and early church all used the Old Testament since the New Testament had not been written, and that's what this scripture was talking about. Uh, the first Corinthians, I've mentioned this before in prior lessons, but it says, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our ad admonition upon whom the ends of the world will come. The whole Testament has example after example of, example of uh, how we are supposed to live and do right before God. The New Testament comments on the value of the Old Testament in Romans 15, 4. It says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. It would be impossible to understand the New Testament without the Old Testament in many instances. For example, the order of Melchizedek and the priesthood. Uh, Jesus is part of the Melchizedek priesthood, not a part of the uh, Levitical priesthood. And we have to understand the Old Testament, Melchizedek priesthood. Uh, he was both a king and a priest to be able to understand why Jesus is uh, considered part of the Melchizedek priesthood today. Uh, Jonah, uh, 
And then the mar remarks of Jesus concerning Jonah when he said the only sign he would give this evil and adulterous generation was that he would be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Uh, the difference between the Jews and the Gentiles and the law and the grace. He said that when he died, he would be in the grave for three days and three nights. And we can count that from the time that he died until he, he came out on Resurrection Sunday. The word testament means will or uh, covenant. The words and the words old and new imply that a change took place by the one who wrote the will. In the New Testament, God entered into a new will, covenant, and from Matthew to Revelation, his will is revealed to us. Jesus, the author of the first will, is the only one that could rewrite or make the new will. So, old will, new will. Jesus, uh, who is author of the old, is the only one that could change uh, to the new. It was old covenant, now we're seeing the new covenant. Jesus had to die on the cross before his will could become effective. Uh, you can't get someone's will until they pass. A will is of no value until the testator is dead, Jesus. For us to gain the inheritance, we must meet the stipulations of his will. We are required to be a member of his family and wear his name. Ephesians 3, 14, 15 says, "...of whom the whole family is named." There's the importance of the name of Jesus being received in baptism. We become his adopted children and bear his name. A lot of people think, well, you don't need to be baptized. You don't have to use Jesus' name. Well, if you're going to become part of his body, he's the head, Jesus. If we're going to become his bride, uh, do we take on his name? If we're going to become part of the family and inherit all the things that uh, are provided for in, in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, uh, we better have that name. Uh, people take that name too lightly. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's a holy name. We better respect that name. We better make sure that name is on our life because it can mean heaven or hell to us. We love you. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all you've shown us. You've given it to us, Lord. We're serving a mighty God. We love you. We praise you forever and ever. Amen.